Also, I think this case is important because it highlights the absurdity and the fallacy of race in that um, race is just a social construct that's there to serve the benefit of the ruling class. So, for example, here you had two classes of people, black and white, and you're saying, okay, Mexican-Americans, you're white. You're just like us, but not really because we're still going to treat you like black people. What's up everyone, it's me, Brooke. Welcome back to the Untold Stories of the Civil Rights Movement, where each week I look at what I think are important civil rights cases, I discuss them, break them down, and let you know why I think they're important. Whether you have joined Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, my blog, or even the podcast, thank you so much for joining. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Also, please be sure to share this video. I would greatly appreciate the shares, and I know people would love this information as well. So it is Hispanic Heritage Month, yay! And in order to honor that, I wanted to discuss the civil rights case that deals with the civil rights of Hispanic Americans. And that case is Hernandez versus Texas from 1954. It was actually the first civil rights case that was ruled upon by the Warren Court and it came two weeks before Brown versus the Board of Education. And it is also the first uh, case argued before the Supreme Court by Mexican Americans. So it's a very critical case. Um, for some reason, not a lot of people know about it, but today we are going to discuss it. I'm excited, let's get into these facts. So the facts of the case. Well, really before we can get into like the meat of what happened here, you have to go back, just some background information to really the Mexican War when it ended in 1848 and the treaty between Mexico and America. So Mex America really acquired a lot of the land from Mexico. Acquired, stole. A lot of Mexico became America after the Mexican War. And part of the treaty between the two nations is that um, the people who were still on the land became American citizens. And what ended up happening is that they were classified as white Americans because back then you really really only had two classes of races. You were either Negro or white. And the Mexicans um, fell under the classification as white citizens. However, they were not treated like white people. They were treated like a different class of people. They were segregated, especially were in Texas because that's where this case come from. They were segregated, they had segregated schools, you had signs that said um, they do not serve Negroes, Mexicans, and dogs. Same kind of treatment that you see with black people. You had the same kind of racial tropes being used as Mexicans being lazy, shiftless, and wanting white women. All of that was used against Mexicans, um, Americans. And so even though legally they were white, they were not treated as such. So after World War II, World War II was kind of this pivotal moment where you had people going abroad, defending this nation and coming back and being treated like second class citizens. You see this with African Americans, they're like, wait, no, I'm not going to be treated like a second class citizen. Um, and so you had a lot of these Mexican American activist groups rising up, demanding uh, protection of the law and fighting against segregation. So there was an attorney named Gustavo or Gus Garcia and he was a part of that legal action. He got he was able to end certain segregation in schools and things like that. Um, but he wanted a much bigger case because all of those legal victories that he received were on the state level. But he said in order to really have an impact, I need to we need to get this case, this issue all the way up to the United States Supreme Court if we could. And so he and his colleagues were looking for a key case, again, a test case, to run it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And that's how we get to this case of Hernandez versus Texas. So the facts of this particular case start in August, on August 5th, 1951, when a man by the name of Catino, Cateno, my Spanish, please forgive my Spanish. Cateno um, Espinosa goes into a Catina on a hot summer day. He wants to chit chat with some people and there are people there having drinks. There's another gentleman there by the name of Pedro Hernandez and he has a bad leg. And I don't know what exactly happened, but what could be heard is that Espinosa said to Hernandez, you know, she doesn't want to be with someone like you. She wants a real he-man like me. And I guess this struck Hernandez to the core. He kind of got up, blanked out went home, got his gun, came back, and shot Espinosa in the heart. Espinosa died 30 minutes later. Nobody was questioning his guilt, but when his mother went to Garcia, or Gus, 
to describe what happened, Gus, the light bulbs went off in his head and he was like, this might be the test case that I'm looking for. And of course you're like, well, how could this be the test case? Like this guy is guilty. And the reason why is because it gets back to the jury such a crucial issue here. So in Texas, there was no overt discrimination against Hispanics in the sense that there were no laws saying that people who are of Mexican descent could not serve on the juries. But in one sense, they felt like they didn't need to because Mexicans were considered whites and of course whites can serve on the jury. Um, but Garcia knew otherwise. He knew that what had happened is that there had been the systematic exclusion of Mexican Americans from juries and, and Garcia knew that this might in fact, this issue might be the issue that could take him all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So he took on this case. He also says, hey, let me get some help from some other attorneys. He gets some help. One by the name of Car Carlos Gardena, a brilliant legal mind. He also got some attorneys to do some statistic, statistical work for him. And what they found is that in the 25 years previously, there had been no people of, well, there's really people who have Hispanic surnames and therefore Hispanics had not served on a jury in the last 25 years. And I think in like 70 different counties in Texas, none had served at all, ever. And so um, he goes into court <laughs> to, to file this motion or to contest this. And when he comes in, the judge asks, do they need interpreters? And he says so eloquently, he's like, um, no, if you can't speak English or Spanish, perhaps one of my people can interpret for you. So that's just a little flavor on who, who Gus Garcia was. They get to trial and of course, Hernandez is convicted. I mean, he was guilty, but he also was convicted by an all Anglo jury, so all white people. And of course, Garcia, he's fine with that because that was his intention all along so that he could then appeal it. He appeals it, of course, it's, it's denied, and then he goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Now, it's also important to note that during this period, um, they were not as well funded as, let's say, the legal defense funds. So they were doing like a crowdsource funding for this appeal because appeals are very costly. And so people were just coming and giving them money because they recognized how important this issue was. Um, they were able to get their legal brief in, but they actually got it in one day late, which could have potentially had the whole case thrown out. But thankfully it did not cost them the case. And, but it was an indication of something else that was going on, which is that um, Gus Garcia, he had a bit of an alcohol problem and that kind of almost risked his case. And in fact, the day before oral arguments, he went out the night before and got pissy drunk. <laughs> got so drunk and he went like, I don't know, on an all night binger and almost cost him the case, but they sobered him up. And he did a phenomenal job because apparently he got an extra 16 minutes during oral, oral arguments, which was just unheard of. They didn't even give that to Thurgood Marshall. The issue, the issue in this case is whether or not it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to exclude people from a particular race, ethnicity, or ancestry just because of their race, ethnicity, and ancestry, the holding. The court held that yes, it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause to exclude people from jury selection just because of their race, ethnicity, or ancestry, the reasoning. So the state of Texas in this case argued that the 14th Amendment only considers or contemplates two classes of races. Black people or Negro is what they said back then, and white people it did not contemplate or consider or intend to protect multiple classes of people such as Hispanic or Mexican Americans. Um, but Garcia argued quite the opposite. He said that we are actually a class apart. We are neither white nor black. Of course, no one wanted to be black back then. Um, but we are a class apart and therefore we deserve protection, equal protection under the law. The court agreed. The court said, if you can show that you are a particular class of people, something separate from black and white, um, and that you are being subjected to discrimination, then the equal protection clause does in fact protect you. And so the court said, yes, here you have shown that Hispanic Americans are in fact a separate class or Mexican Americans, which by the way, I forgot to point out this in the fact section that when um, Carlos Cardinia got up to speak during or oral arguments, because it was him and Garcia, um, he says, you know, your honors, I am American of Mexican descent. And one of the justices goes, what is that? Like he had never heard that. And then another justice says, I think they call them greasers. That was Justice Frankfurt. 
Frankfurter. And then another one, a couple of them were asking like these kind of asinine questions like, well, can Mexican Americans speak English? So they were up against that kind of a panel. Nevertheless, they were able to convince them. And a lot of, I think a lot of it had to do with the eloquence of Garcia. Um, but Garcia was able to convince them that Mexican Americans are a distinct class of people that are neither white nor black, and they are deserving of the equal protection. And the court said, yes, you have convinced us they're a separate class. And given the information, the statistics that you showed as far as like no Hispanic Americans serving on juries in the last 25 years, the fact that you had outside in the courthouse in Texas, you had a bathroom for whites, and then you had a bathroom for Negroes and hombres aquí is what it said there. So you had two different bathrooms, one just for white people, another one for everyone else. So clearly they're distinct from white people, even though you're trying to say that they're white. And so the court using Strader, which said that, hey, you can't discriminate against people strictly because of their background. And also using the Norris case, which is the Scottsboro boys saying, hey, we're not gonna turn a blind eye to the statistical evidence here. There's clearly been some kind of systematic and intentional exclusion. They're saying, look, if it had been like one case where you didn't have any Hispanics on the jury, then fine. But in 25 years, you're just asking us to defy logic here. And so we can't do it. This is intentional discrimination. It violates the Equal Protection Clause. So the court um, ended up reversing Hernandez's conviction. He was again tried and again convicted because, hello, he was guilty and no one was really disputing that. They were disputing the process. So Gus Garcia, sadly, he suffered from mental health issues, um, alcoholism adding to that. He was in and out of institutions. Um, he was disbarred for two years because of writing bad checks. And eventually, sadly, he died of liver failure just 10 years after this case. Um, just a, a brilliant mind who couldn't sustain it all, I think. It's just a tragic. Carlos Cardinha, on the other hand, he did well. And he actually became the first Hispanic American to serve in the Texas Appeals Court. And he became the chief judge and the first Hispanic to do so. So he did very well. So why is this case important? Well, like I said in the beginning of the episode, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. So I definitely wanted to highlight a case that dealt with civil rights and Hispanic Americans. And it just, it's not only Hispanic Americans, but it also broadened the scope of the 14th Amendment. And so the work that they did not only impacted Hispanics, but it really helped everybody else and, and made the Constitution more realized to more Americans. And I think that's important. Also, I think this case is important because it highlights the absurdity and the fallacy of race and that um, race is just a social construct that's there to serve the benefit of the ruling class. So for example, here, you had two classes of people, black and white, and you're saying, okay, Mexican Americans, you're white. You're just like us, but not really because we're still gonna treat you like black people. We're still gonna subjugate you. We're still gonna segregate you. But when you try to assert your rights, well, you're white for the purposes of asserting your rights. So we owe you nothing. And it's just a fallacy and it's an absurdity. And this case highlights that as well. If you like this video, please be sure to hit the like button below or above or wherever it is. Please share this video again, share, share, share. It's great information. I would love it if you could share it. Um, please be sure to follow me. I am on Facebook, I am on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I am on YouTube, of course. And I have a blog, palookiesworld.com. Please be sure to follow me there. I'm also on Patreon. If you love what I'm doing here, I would greatly appreciate your support. And also, please follow the podcast. If you haven't already, you can subscribe and listen to it there. And I would love it if you left a review. Five-star reviews are obviously preferred. Um, please leave a review. That helps people find the podcast. Um, and also, like, leave a comment. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, be vigilant, be blessed. See you next week. Bye.